Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Morris, and I'm here to tell you that DOD has a terrible problem, uh, uh, in case you didn't know already. Um, I, I work with a group that's investigating how we do better, a better job of summarizing and, search, and searching through aerial surveillance video. Um, the problem is actually that we have a huge volume of it, and we simply do not have the personnel available who can analyze that information. So what tends to happen if you happen to be somebody working at the tactical level, uh, there are uh, tactical teams that spend literally eight hours a day staring at, at video, and this happens three shifts over the course of a day, every day. And there won't be any more manpower to do that, or person power, personnel to do that, men and women to do that. So we have to find a way to do better. It's also a problem at the strategic level where we're finding the proliferation of weapon systems throughout the world. The problem there is, of course, the huge amount of area that we surveil that we really never even analyze what's going on there because we don't, do not have good systems to tip and cue the analyst as to what's happening and to summarize what they see. So we're working on several core technologies to improve that situation. And uh, the researchers who are actually doing the work are here with me, and they'll actually do the, the hard part of the presentation, which is to provide the technical detail. But one of the things we're working on is how do we address the problem of the lack of training data? That's been mentioned several times, I'm sure, in this session over the last couple of days. And uh, the people I work with in DOD and elsewhere um, very clearly say this is a continuing problem and we have to address it. Uh, we'll be talking about domain adaptation, which is one way to address the problem of limited data. Another thing we'll be talking about is how do you, once, once we now can, once we have adequate data to build good classifiers to recognize objects from an aerial perspective, what's the next step? Well, we have to track those objects. And it turns out that that's another core technology that has yet to advance to a state that's sufficient for DOD needs. Uh, we have a person that'll talk about some improvements that we're making in that core technology. And finally, once we get to the point where we can actually identify objects and track these objects, what's the next step? Well, we believe the next step is to recognize patterns in the data based on those uh, detections and tracks. So I'd like to introduce Rachel brower sinning who will speak to domain adaptation. Thank you, Rachel. So solving classification problems with machine learning starts with having sufficient relevant labeled data, as Ed just said. But the DOD problem sets that we currently have have the limitations of making this difficult that might not be reflective of the environment that we want, so it might not really be relevant. And it might not also be labeled. And there may also be limited examples of the target data. Filling in these gaps with commercially available data sets do present problems. So we have differences in perspectives. Do we have something at the ground level? aerial or overhead? What is our scale in the image? So how far away are we to the object? Are there differences in the types of objects we're interested in? So is a publicly available data set interested in cats, whereas we're interested in dogs? Um, and then what's the density of the objects in the data set? So are there a few objects or many objects in each image? And then there are also differences in texture. Are we talking about um, different environments? So an example would be urban versus rural, or difference in the diversity of the objects. So domain adaptation is seeking to take a well-performing model from one domain and transfer it into a different but related domain. And this aspect of the project is working on determining how that initial model should be built so that we can do this transfer while maintaining performance. So our research, our, our research motivation was can we take an existing labeled data set drawn from a non-mission environment and use it to train a detector that would work on a mission environment. So firstly, can this data set be used to alter a small amount of labeled targeted data in the event that we do have labeled data? And can we use this, or can we use this data to completely replace the need for labeled data in the target domain altogether? So to do this, we did take that existing labeled data set um, and worked to get a similar perspective, not exactly the same, so they were both aerial, uh, with surrounding environmental features, object density, and the actual perspective being different. So we subsetted this data set to make it match the mission environment, and then used a cycle GAN 
to um, transfer the textures. We did match object density as we found that improved the performance of the cycle gain on matching the textures as the differences between the, um, the two domains was no longer uh, the density of the targets. So once we now had this, these data sets, we trained object classifiers on things such as the original um, data set from our training domain, the small set of target data, the adapted data, and different combinations. So why do we even need to do this? So on the right is an example of truly bad object detection. Um, what is labeled as a car in most cases is not a car. Uh, cars are not labeled as cars and people are not correctly labeled as people. There are almost no correct annotations in that image whatsoever. On the right is where we were able to train it more in our target domain. So cars are now correctly labeled as cars, even though there are still quite a few misclassifications. There are fewer than what is in the left. So our results are presented in mean average precision in this case, uh, so which is just the average precision for each object class. Um, in this graph, uh, oh, in the source environment is the environment in which we have a lot of labeled data. Our target environment is where we have little to no labeled uh, data. And the semantic match target environment is where we match the object density. So the perspective and scale of the objects are still different. So as previously mentioned, with just out of the box object detection, uh, the performance is very bad. Whenever we take a classifier that is trained solely on the source environment and then fit it into the target environment, we see our performance decrease by half. So in this case, we were not able to maintain, or it did not maintain performance. Whenever we took a small amount of the target data and trained a classifier on that, the performance, because there was only a small amount of labels, was still not as good as what we would get uh, if we had a lot of data. So can we add data to this to improve performance? And unfortunately, the answer right now is no. Just taking the approach of matching object density and swapping textures was not sufficient to increase performance. And then in the final case of can this replace labeled data, unfortunately, right now, the answer to that is also no. As without that small amount of target data, it was better than nothing, but it still had a huge decrease in performance. So where we're going in the future is currently we're only matching on object density. Uh, from what is apparent here is that needs to be increased to match uh, image scale and viewing angle. So we are working on identifying data sets to allow us to do that match. And then once we get that, we will repeat this experiment and see if we are able to um, maintain that performance. But the other thing that we found while looking at truly bad object detection was that there are a set of feature feature statistics in the image that appear to indicate whenever your object detection is poor, which is leading us to develop a flag to indicate when you actually have poor automatic object detection. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up Adam Harley, who's a PhD student on campus. He's been working with us now for over a year, I guess. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ed, for the introduction. <clears throat> so I'm working on the problem of tracking, tracking people, cars, almost anything that moves. And I'm doing this using aerial data. So you can see on the left a video captured by a, a drone in a synthetic environment where it's high above the scene and it's looking at these people uh, walking along a fence. And so we want to track those people but the difficulty here, or what makes a standard tracker fail, is that not only are, there, are the people moving, but everything is moving. The fence is moving, the ground is moving, the bushes are moving, and it's hard to disentangle the objects from the background. So what we'd like to do is instead track in a stabilized space, as shown on the right. So this is the output of my approach, where I'm first going to estimate the geometry of the scene, and then I'm going to use the geometry to place us into a better viewpoint where we have a stationary camera, and only the moving stuff is moving in pixels. So to estimate the geometry, I use an estimate of the, the ground plane, which I can get from an approximate uh, position of the drone. And I also, I also use the RGB image captured by the drone to get fine-grained details of what's happening on the ground. Those two pieces of information are enough to enough for a network to figure out the metric distance of every pixel in the scene. 
So if you supervise this with enough data, you're able to estimate the depth of all the pixels. And that represents the scene's geometry, which combined with the camera's motion allows you to do this stabilization. The tracker that I'm using is fairly standard. Given the uh, two frames, let's say, of like an object in frame one, object in frame two, we can extract features of the object in the first frame and then search for uh, new occurrences of that feature in the next frame. So this is just a cross-correlation where you're lo looking for a match in feature space. That matching produces heat maps, uh, where the heat map represents the probability of a match in, in the next frame. You're, you can refine those heat maps with things like velocity and uh, trajectories, and you can also do good assignment if you have multiple objects with some greedy matching strategies. But all of this is fairly standard. The key is that um, uh, we produce these heat maps uh, and we try them with both with unstabilized inputs and stabilized inputs where everything else is pretty much constant. Uh, and you can see I'm actually producing a set of heat maps where the set represents all the potential rotations of the object. So I'm allowing the object to both translate and rotate and I'm getting the best match across all these. And all that I'm going to vary in my experiment is whether uh, the input is this unstabilized raw stuff that I get from the cameras or the post-processed stabilized data that I get from the geometric approach. So while qualitatively the heat maps maybe look similar, quantitatively there's a noticeable improvement in performance. So with the, the basic unstabilized uh, version, I can get tracking accuracy of about 50%. As I add bells and whistles to the approach, like data augmentation and fancier matching strategies for multi-object confusions, I can improve that to about 65%. But then when I switch the input from this unstabilized stuff to the stabilized stuff, we get a very noticeable improvement of 10 to 15%. So this is saying that it's very beneficial to have the tracker operate in the stabilized space. One thing that we're excited about for the future is uh, to do forecasting in this stabilized space. So in these videos, if you were to trace with your finger where the object is traveling, that trajectory, as you'd see on, you can see on the left, would be nearly random because it's the object's motion combined with the drone's motion. So those trajectories are pretty much unpredictable and you can't really do forecasting with any reasonable accuracy. But in the stabilized space, the trajectories make a lot more sense. We start to see that the, we can see that that person in the top right is just following essentially the path near the fence. And similarly for the car shown on the bottom right, it's also just driving along a path. So in the stabilized space, it's much easier to track and to forecast. Thank you, Adam. One thing I want to say is those that work in the field know that to get a 15% jump in performance for one of these machine learning algorithms is pretty significant. Uh, typically, the, the improvements are very incremental. But this is a pretty big jump, so we're pretty excited about that. So the question is, what do we do once we get, once we're better at identifying objects because we have more data to train on, and once we can track objects better? And, and we believe the next step forward is to be able to identify patterns of life uh, based on this uh, aerial surveillance data. I'd like to introduce Jeff Hansen, who has done some work in this area. Oops. So one of the things we realized early on is that as we develop these you know, object detection and, and tracking algorithms, we're going to be inundated with new types of data that we uh, need to analyze. And, uh, we kind of view this as sort of a hierarchy of detectors. So we have sort of at the, the left, very left edge, we have our object identifications coming in, uh, our you know, basic level of tracking coming in, and then the idea is we want to apply, take, take the output of those detectors in, and send those to new detectors to get, get sort of higher levels of, of uh, information out, such as people patrolling, you know, figure out what, what core behaviors are, and that, you know, can sort of continue on to higher level levels where we might be able to detect things like insurgents reinforcing a building or holding a high-level target, 
And so uh, that's sort of the motivation motion of, of, of this work, work here. Um, and so we ask ourselves the question, so suppose that, that we already have perfect trackers, we have perfect object detectors, what can we do with that, with that data? And so we did this uh, using a simulation experiment. We call this sort of the, the mall parking lot experiment. And so in this experiment, you can imagine that you have a camera or a, uh, a drone that that's, that's, has its camera trained on a parking lot. We can see cars and people moving around in this parking lot. And the question is, can we figure out what these cars and people are doing from that? And so for this simulation, um, which you see sort of on the, sort of the, the left figure here, uh, we use a simulation tool called Sumo. It's a you know, very uh, popular uh, traffic simulation tool that's, that's used by civil engineers to, to study traffic. Um, you can actually take like open street map from sort of city-sized chunks of space and it will, will simulate the movement of cars and vehicles in that space where everyone's, you know, following traffic laws, you know, uh, you know, traffic lights are simulated and so forth. And so using the simulator, we built a simulation that had sort of 10 different classes of moving things from sort of four different types of activities. And so one of the activities were shoppers. Shoppers, of course, want to park near the front of the parking lot. They'll park their car, they'll walk into the store, they'll do their business, and then they'll come out, and then they'll go home. And then another type of ac activity are the uh, employees. And the employees, they're expected to park at the back of the parking lot. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, and they will, you know, park, they'll go into the store, they'll, they'll, uh, you know, stay for pro probably a longer period of time than the employees would, and then they'll leave and go home. And then the next type were, were sort of opportunistic users of the parking lots. For example, uh, carpoolers. So you can imagine that um, you have a set of, of vehicles, maybe two or three or four. They park somewhere in the lot, and then everybody sort of piles into one car. That car leaves, goes to work, comes back, Everybody fans out again to their own car and then go home. So that's sort of the third category of activity. And then the fourth category of activity were the drug dealers. So uh, you imagine you have you know, a drug dealer and a buyer. They go into the parking lot. You know, the buyer goes to the drug dealer's car. They conduct their business, and then they split up and go their own ways. And so now the question is, just from the way... Uh, vehicles and people move around in this environment, can we figure out what class uh, they belong to? And to do this, uh, we, we took sort of a, an egocentric patch approach where we generated this sort of uh, kind of crazy looking diagram uh, from the activity around uh, each of the movers. And the way to interpret this is to imagine that for each entity, a person or vehicle moving around the environment, you attach a piece of paper to the top of their head. And the, to the top of every other moving object in the, in the environment, you put a pen that's sort of drawing on this piece of paper. And then at maybe certain key locations, like intersections or so forth for landmarks, you have another pen. And so as I move around in the environment, I'm going to trace out these tracks of my uh, relative position of other moving objects and, and, and landmarks in the, in the uh, environment, and I'm going to get sort of this image that represents uh, my activity. And so now we're going to take that sort of activity representing egocentric patch, and we're going to use sort of traditional image analysis, machine learning algorithms such as uh, uh, CNN convolutional neural nets, and then and, 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 and train a classifier uh, to detect this. And so once we did that, we found that we were actually able to correctly identify the, the track type with 86% 80, accuracy. So we got, you know, we were pretty pleased, pleased with the uh, overall uh, uh, track type. And I say 10 class types because, you know, of those four activities, you have like an, an employee card, employee person. Uh, for, you know, the drug deal, you have the dr drug, drug dealer's car, the buyer's car, the buyer person, and so those are the, the individual ten, 10 classes there. Um, 
Now, what we don't notice here is from the, for the confusion matrix, so this is saying that, you know, the actor class was zero, the predicted class is zero. So for that class, I think this might be uh, employee vehicle. Uh, we did very well. And so we see on sort of seven of the classes, we did, did pretty well. The ones that we had the most trouble with were the drug dealer uh, related classes because those were relatively rare events. Uh, we did find, I don't have it shown who, but if you play with the sort of the weights in, in how you train the model, you can improve the score on the drug dealers at the expense of overall accuracy a little bit. So that was, that was our, our classification experiment. And then we did another experiment. So this one is looking at, we used a slightly different approach in this experiment. This is a, an anomaly detection experiment. And again, uh, we were using the SUMO traffic simulation tool. And uh, in this one, we simulated, you know, 900, we, we took a section of Oakland. So here's the, so somewhere around here, the SEI. Um, and we generated random trips. So a trip is a car going from one location to another location using the best possible path. And so 950 of those vehicles took the best path. And then we handcrafted an additional track that didn't use a, a, a best app, that uses some sort of convoluted zigzag path to the network. And then in this one, we used an LSTM autoencoder. And then the, the idea here is we use an LSTM that looks at the, uh, at the uh, it, it encodes the, the, the steps of the track, uh, and then it tries to, to, to decode that, that, that step of the track, uh, the steps of the track, and then we look at how well did the, the autoencoder decode the track? And then, then the, the thinking here is if it's an unusual track, uh, the reconstruction error is going to be high, and that will be an indication that the uh, track is anomalous. Um, so when we did that, we, we sort of ran this experiment, you know, hundreds of times, you know, looking at uh, what does the anomaly score distribution look like over all my vehicles compared to sort of our, our zigzag vehicles, and we found that our sort of a zigzag vehicle was consistently scoring uh, near the very top in terms of the anomaly score distribution. Um, we also looked at, you know, you know, we did see that there are a few vehicles up here who are, you know, some of the, you know, the randomly generated ones that are still scoring high, and so we were wondering, so what kinds of, of, of behaviors do we see here? And we saw that the vehicles that inhibited here were things like vehicles that got stuck in traffic jams. So, you know, remember what, you know, traffic lights and everything are being simulated here. So if you had a vehicle that got stuck behind a traffic light for, you know, two or three cycles, uh, those were the types of vehicles we ended up uh, seeing sort of in this, this, this top part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the graph. All right, so I'll turn it back to Ed. Just to quickly summarize, because I want to get to the question. So what, what happens if we get increased training data for better object identification, better tracking, and we can characterize patterns of life? Uh, basically, we can effectively process more data for the analyst. We can cue them and tip them for events that are occurring. We can provide summaries to them. Now, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions, and I'm going to warn you that I've seated the audience. So if you don't have any, we're going to have some anyways. Questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, you, you show your data in the context of visual imagery or visual video. Have you looked at another sensing modality, how this might transfer to infrared? Um, we have done some IR image uh, detection. So there is. We actually took a standard object detector and we retrained it effectively for, with transfer learning type of strategies for IR data. It did surprisingly well because those cars are bright white in IR data. Uh, excuse me? How um, well? Kevin, are you here? Yeah. What was our performance on that? I think, well, so we had um, the limited. <laughs> So on, on the limited data set we had, I think it was around um, 70, maybe 80? Yeah, and we did nothing other than retrain an existing object detector in that case. Um, yes. 
Any other questions, or do I go to the seated ones? Oh, you guys are in trouble now. Uh, here's one for Rachel. Rachel, <laughs> why, why do ML algorithms have such a hard time adapting to new situations? Yeah. Oh, I have to use that one? Oh, okay. Uh, I would say the first instance would be the model's overfit. So you had a, rel maybe a relatively simple split would explain your model, but you added a lot of additional data to get really well, good performance on your training data at the expense of your testing data. Another situation might be where the features that the model detected and identified as different were not what you anticipated. An example of that might be a house cat versus a wild cat classifier. You might be thinking, oh, there's a lot of different features between a lion and a tabby, but the algorithm might pick up one sitting on a couch and one's not uh, as the primary feature, uh, which would then go back to perhaps your um, data that your model was trained on was not representative of the real world example that you were trying to extrapolate out to. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another one from, from an, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Adam, could the object tracking approach you gener uh, developed be extended to include situations where there's occlusion, for example, going under an overpass or potentially uh, under foliage? Yes, that's one of the main um, uh, features, I think, of having a forecaster along with a tracker, because as the object travels, say, into an occluded area, then we still have the forecaster running, which can estimate where the object will reemerge in the scene. And then we can have the tracker ready to pick up the object once it reemerges at that point. Thank you, Adam. And finally, we have one for Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, yes. Oh, we got another one. We got a real one. Uh, do you look at the significance of the activity in the context of different types of points of interest as opposed to just the activity itself? Um, it would be possible to do so, yes. We, we currently don't, although we're working with um, several DOD programs, and, and they're particularly interested in what goes on at certain places, as you can imagine. So that, that would be an extension. Yes? A quick question. So this is for Rachel. Did you use simulated data in addition to real data? for the uh, training of the models? Uh, yes, we did use combinations of simulated and real. There, there's an issue with simulated data, and I think most people are aware, is that you don't necessarily know what the detectors are picking up on, right? And it makes it difficult to, to apply it sometimes. But uh, we think it's a, a way forward into situations, particularly where we have very few um, uh, objects uh, very few examples of the objects we want to detect. Any other ones in the audience, or should I go to my last seated one? Jeff, there's one for you. What a surprise. Um, how would you extend the pattern of life detection work that you've done so far? So some of the things that we want to do are, are start looking at more, you know, larger, more complex DOD-relevant scenarios. We've done some work towards putting one of those together. Um, also, the, you know, as you saw from the confusion matrix, we, we still have some difficulties with sort of the rare class cases. So looking at sort of how to handle sort of the rare uh, behavior classes. And finally, um, looking at sort of the anomaly detection. The anomaly detection experiment we did here was looking at a single track at a time. So we'd like to look at, at tracks in contact, in contact with other tracks or other types of behaviors to sort of augment uh, the, the ability to sort of look at those interactions and find anomalies within the interactions as well as individual tracks. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Um.